Everyone to take a seat, please. Okay, it is now um, 10 to, and so I resume the hearing. Um, and, um, yes, as I promised, I'll go... to the question of um, the AONB. Um, this is, uh, the, the, we're already at the third of my questions for today. Um, are the uh, allocations deliverable having regard um, to, in this case now, environmental or other constraints? Um, yeah, and I think that overlaps probably with issue 10.26 as well, so I'll take those things together. And 10.26 um, is, are the proposed allocations justified and appropriate in terms of the likely impacts of the development? So this is all about impacts of the development and environmental and other constraints. As I say, we'll take the AONB first of all. Um, is that you, Mr. Smith? That oh, Ms. Symes. Thank you, sir. Um, as just, um, pointed out in our statement at paragraph 22, um, we have a statement of common ground that's um, signed with that's ED52 with Natural England, where it is agreed that that they do not consider the Luton sites to have a material impact on the Chilterns AONB or its setting, as confirmed by the landscape assessments accompanying their pl planning application. So that's obviously in terms of more detailed assessments that's been undertaken. We've also prepared, you will recall that this issue was raised previously um, about the proposed boundary um, application that's been put in by the Chilterns AONB um, and we have prepared a note to that effect, that's at ED89. Right, so if you bear with me, I'll just uh, grab those documents to hand. It's ED52 for the um, Natural England Statement of Common Ground and ED89. So which paragraph was it in the Statement of Common Ground? Paragraph 4.10. 4. Right, OK. Um, Yes, um, just to check, um, do I take it that this is a signed statement of common ground? That's correct, yes. Okay, it's just on... It's just on, redacted, yes. been redacted. Signatures have been redacted on our, on our, for our website. Yes, okay, so that we can't all copy um, Councillor Levitt's signature when writing checks. Um, and this says, um, it's agreed that the sites to the east of Luton... Uh, do not have a material impact on the AOMB or its setting as confirmed by the landscape assessments accompanying the planning applications in this area. The SASEA and associated landscape assessment, however, state that the allocations can only accommodate small-scale development with respect to non-AONB landscapes of high value. Um, what does that mean when it talks about um, the allocations can only accommodate small-scale development? That's in terms of the actual landscape character of the area, and it, it's, it, the area is, is characterised by ridge lines and plateaus, and it's about actually 
having a good design in terms of, look, of taking on to con into consideration the actual landscape character of the area. Yeah, yeah my apologies. I, I didn't follow that. Could you... Um... Good afternoon. Um, we have carried out various landscape character assessments for the, the area. Um, oh, sorry. The, just give a little potted history uh, of what you probably see as in some of the evidence, if not already. To stop me if uh, I'm going over things you already know, sir. Um, <coughs> the character assessment was first done in 2002 by BAPTI. It was part of a county-wide study. And those defined the areas 202, 203, the areas throughout the county. That was then supplemented in 2011 by a study that looked at sensitivity and capacity of those character areas to different types of development, in, in terms of different types of capacity for different types of development. So within the, the application area, 202, a range of different um, development types, including... Uh, Large-scale residential, small-scale residential were set out in terms of suitability. And, and that defined that there was, in the actual, it might be worth turning to the document so you see what, we, what was meant. And um, what's the reference number for it? It's CG16. Page number is 48A. Apologies, page 48A. And just for your ease of reference, where there's a page number that's 47 or 40, 40, 48 without a, a small A or B, that's part of the original assessment carried out by BAPTI. The small A's indicate it was a later addition as part of the 2011 report that covered sensitivity. And in that study from that page, page 48 covers first the broad um, inherent landscape sensitivity, covers description of landscape value, and then there's a paragraph on capacity to accommodate development of different scales. The way large-scale development in this context was seen as being above five hectares, which is probably about 150 to 200 houses. So therefore, the allocations... Uh, proposed are clearly in that category. And for that size, it was suggested that there's a low to moderate um, capacity for such development. Various, various guidelines were set out on page 48C in terms of if built development went ahead, what type of criteria would be applied to it. Uh, where was that, sorry? 48C. It's, it's all the section under the headings of Area 202. They're all pertinent to the actual um, the proposed allocations. Okay, and I can see there built development guidelines. Is that the thing? Yes. yes. That, that's right. That gives individual... Um, descriptions to some of the features that would need to be preserved, but it also gives some indicators that if development did come forward, how you'd try to, uh, to mitigate that. So it, it, it's an overview 
description for the whole of a character area. It's not specific development brief, but it helps to guide development within that character area, within the context of it being seen as being having low to moderate capacity for development of the scale proposed. Um, yeah, okay. What, what I'm trying to um, understand is the, um, the pertinence or the relevance of the sentence in the uh, Statement of Common Ground with Natural England. Um, the first bit is quite straightforward. It's agreed that the sites east of Luton do not have a material impact on the AOMB or its setting as confirmed by the landscape assessments accompanying the planning applications in this area. It's the second sentence um, that I'm, I'm wrestling with that says the SASEA and associated landscape assessment, however, states that the allocations can only accommodate small-scale development with respect to non-AOMB landscapes of high value. Well, I, th I think that there we are, the site would be, obviously it's not in the ANOB, yeah. uh, so they're referring to land that is adjacent or within the vicinity of, and therefore I think the allocation would fall within that broader remit. And then it's a question of whether one how one categorises whether that landscape is of high value. And they don't state exactly if it is of high value. Um, the study that I just pointed you to stated it was of low to moderate value in terms of the, um, the study that, that Council has part of their evidence base. So I think in particular, I, I would suggest as well that in our assessment work, and it's been um, reinforced by other studies done by the consultants as well, uh, are that... The, the plateau where the housing allocation is proposed is sensitive, but relatively less sensitive than other parts of the land further to the east, and in particular the Lily Valley Bottom, which is much more unaffected by built form or the edge of Luton, and has a more distinctive character, perhaps more akin to the AOMB itself. draw the, the contrast there that you can take taken to page 48 if you scroll back to page 44 you'll see a map there which shows the area that this landscape parcel covers in the bottom left yeah and although not necessarily easiest to discern essentially you can see this landscape puzzle will this landscape parcel covers the entirety of the area within which el1 2 and 3 lie and as you've already been directed to, the conclusion on 48 is that this parcel is of a moderate low landscape value. If I could then contrast that by just asking you to turn to page 81. Yep. So that's the adjoining landscape character parcel. Effectively, so beyond the allocation, as this is area two one two Lily Bottom. Lily Bottom, as Mr. Billingsley sort of directed you to, and if again, if you turn over the page to page eighty five, you'll see that that one's identified as having moderate high sensitivity and moderate high landscape value. So I think, in terms of your initial question, the Natural England MOU, obviously that refers to limited capacity within higher sensitivity areas. So areas such as parcel 212, I would suggest is what they're referring to there. And I think the point Mr Billingsley's made is that area 202, by contrast, is a moderate low value, so it's not captured by Natural England's exemption or reservation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, well, what do you call it? Aviat. OK. So it's not caught by the, in inverted commas, caveat in paragraph 4.10. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Obviously, that refers to non-AOMB landscapes of high value. And I say the parcel within which the allocation, as Mr Billingsley said, is moderate, low value. It's the adjoining parcel. Once you get over the ridge that we've already heard about down into the valley, that's identified as moderate, high value. Okay, I understand that now. Uh, 
Um, I think um, I, I cut you off, Miss Symes. Thank you, sir. Um, just to say that the other document that I was referring to was ED89, which was the note that you asked us to prepare for you um, in respect to the Children's Conservation Board request for reviewing the children's A and B boundary. In that note, we, well, we give you a little bit of a background about the Children's Conservation Board, and then we also talk about the actual application that was submitted back in 2013, um, which was prepared um, <coughs> by the Children's Conservation Board, and that was to amend or review the children's boundary, not only in North Hertfordshire, but in other areas as well within the Chilterns. Yep. Um, it also makes reference to... Um, that North Hertfordshire at the time, in 2010, um, we, we went to our cabinet and, and um, wanted to, uh, well, we were in agreement to investigate the possibility of pr promoting a review of the boundary at that time. And the application has said went in in 2013. But um, since then, the application has been with Natural England and we have not had any, um, other than the fact that they've received it, we've had no further correspondence or up-to-date correspondence from them as to at what time they propose to review the boundary as when it will appear on their, their work program. So at this point in time, we're still a number of years on, and we haven't yet, um, yet to, to have any formal notification from them. Do they have any sort of targets for that kind of thing, or um, or what? I don't think they do, sir. The only thing, all we've done in our note is we've tried to sort of um, draw your attention to other um, applications that they're busy, that they're in the process of reviewing at the moment, which appear to be taking around three to four years. You can't appeal for non-determination. Okay. Nothing so, what are you me. telling me? Are you, are, you, are you suggesting that there's not any kind of immediate prospect, are you, of, of the boundary um, being altered? At this point in time. Is that the general point? Yes, I think there's no immediate prospect of it being reviewed, let alone altered. Um, does that seem to be about the size of it to you, Ms. Murford? Um, it is certainly true that we've applied to Natural England and that we had North Hearts' full support in doing so at the time um, and that the area now proposed for allocation falls entirely within the area we would like in the AOMB and at the area that North Hearts identified as being suitable for the boundary review. Um, and it's true that there are um, very small staffing at Natural England working on boundary review um, and that they've been fully occupied with, um, they were joining up the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales with a National Park extension and now they've moved on to the Suffolk um, coast and, and heaths and um, there are I think 13 others like us um, sort of jockeying for position to be the next one. As I understand it, the um, Suffolk coast and heath review will take till late 2018. Um, Who's to say whether we might be next? I have no information. They will not give us any instructions to whether we are next or um, last or we're somewhere between, <laughs> you know, we could be next. Uh, so okay. it could be well within this plan period. It could be later on this year, early next year, that um, our review commences. 
say, are you a glass half full type of person? I don't like to speculate. I, mean, I, I do think, though, that the um, Michael Gove's environment plan published a couple of weeks ago signals a, a, um, an increased uh, emphasis on national parks and AOMBs, and it promises uh, a, a new uh, Hobhouse type review of national parks and looking at designated areas. I know the Cotswolds have indicated that they would like to be a national park. We're considering whether to look at the same sort of, um, make the same sort of request. So I think that the likelihood is that there is going to be more resources, more emphasis, and more government interest in uh, protecting the most special landscapes, and that there may well be some structural changes and um, different financial and structural arrangements for <coughs> who should look after AOMBs and national parks. And whether there's scope for expansion, they use that, that term in the okay. environment plan. Okay. Um, so back in 2010, 2013, um, the, the council um, was supportive of the notion of this area um, being included uh, within the AONB. Is that right? Being included within a review. Within a boundary. review. Yes. Is there a difference? Yes, because one would expect the boundary area to be reviewed and then a judgment made as to what part, if any, of that area should or should not be included within the AOMB. Hmm. But the council's position on that has shifted? shifted and that we're supportive of of a review as I say I think it's it's drawing a distinction between identifying an area within which a review may take place and what the outcomes of that review may be um, just probably the one's direct to is within ED 89 at appendix A where it says the case for re reviewing the boundary of the OMB which I think is the document put in by the, the Chilterns board so ED 89 appendix says that as, as part of the submission accordingly the board has deliberately not identified a precise boundary for each area whilst a potential AOMB extension has been identified with a possible boundary usually in line with the boundary of the landscape character area units a more in-depth assessment is needed to determine the most appropriate boundary should the Chilterns be selected as an AOMB for further boundary review work so obviously it's not for us to, to second guess natural England where that process goes but just on the landscape evidence we've already pointed you to. Obviously, there's two distinct landscape areas, one of which is of moderate low sensitivity and one of and value, and one of which is of higher value, which obviously is beyond the proposed allocation. Okay. Ms. Murphy. Can I come back to say, uh, I, I agree, we did make the, the boundaries fuzzy on the application to natural England. You'll see the sort of lozenges and the strange hatching, but um, North Hearts' map is far more specific. The last page of my statement shows quite a clear boundary with no fuzzy edges, which does include this area for boundary review. As a, so they agreed <coughs> that this area was worthy of consideration for boundary, A and B bound, boundary review. Um, is that right? Did uh, what Ms. Murphy said there, the council thought it was worthy of um, being looked at. I think, yes, it's, it's worth being looked at. Um, I mean, if it wasn't for Luton being the size it was, of course, the Chilterns run straight through Luton. So it, there's a need to actually look at the area that's a remaining countryside that would potentially fulfil those criteria. Um, <coughs> if, I'm, if I may point you as well, sir, to the uh, study we mentioned earlier from C CG16, um, particularly in the, the methodology there in section pa from page 10, it shows that in, in order to, to try and identify what the, the landscape value was, uh, we used the natural beauty criteria 
that um, Natural England had come up with and applied the relevant ones to the different character areas within the district. And it was on that basis that the uh, character area 202 came up relatively lower than other areas seen as being of higher value. Okay, so um, where we are today then is that um, it's not an area um, with, within the AONB um, and it's right, is it, that I shouldn't treat it as such um, but I'm invited to consider it as being part of the setting um, of the AONB. Is that correct? Is there agreement that it's part of the setting of the AONB? I think it depends on what you mean by setting, really. I think. Well, that was going to be my next question. Yes, um, you, you tell me. Th there, there are probably... There's one identified viewpoint within the AONB. Um, I think it's viewpoint 12 within the Bloor Homes um, landscape assessment. That's just north of the A505, and uh, maybe it's one of the few points you should go to, sir, to, uh, to see. And there's, therefore, there, there would be, in my view, a, a modest, at most, impact from that particular viewpoint. Um, it's potentially likely you might see towards where the school is to be located. It's potential, so one has to factor that in. Um, so that's one that's worth looking at. But I'm not aware of other viewpoints within the NAB, so... There's a limited impact on the setting, particularly from a visual point of view. And in terms of character, the remainder of the, the A and B would remain unaffected. OK, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. What, what I'm just trying to establish um, is um, the thought process that I have to go through. Um, and I don't have to decide, do I, on the impact of this development on the AOMB as such, because it's not in the AOMB. Um, I'm invited um, by Ms Murphy's to um, consider the impact on the setting of the AONB and um, the, the council in, in that regard um, points to the um, statement of common ground with Natural England um, which also refers to the, the AONB or its setting and thus um, in that common ground the question of setting is one that's addressed. Have I got all of that right? Ms Murphy? Okay, um, if I could help it with the definition of what the AOMB setting is. Um, I've referred in my statement to um, a position statement that the Children's Conservation Board produced a number of years ago called Development Affecting the Setting of the Children's AOMB. And um, in my statement I've uh, quoted the, the definition. So if I could um, read that to you. The setting of the AOMB is the area within which development and land management proposals by virtue of their nature, size, scale, siting, materials or design could be considered to have an impact either positive or, ne or negative on the natural beauty and special qualities of the children's AOMB. Now of course there's a, a duty under the Crow Act to um, have regard to the AOMB that applies to us as the Children's Conservation Board, to all public bodies including the council and to you sir as a planning inspector. I, um, I will be clear that I will have regard to the you. setting of the AOMB. Thank you very much. Um, and the instruction is that, uh, in, in the Crow Act, is that the, that duty does not just apply within the AOMB. The only consideration is whether land in the AOMB is affected, not where the effect originates. So as in this case, where you've got a large urban extension near the AOMB, um, there, you have to consider whether there will be impacts on the AOMB. What I think is a bit of a flaw uh, that I think, I'm afraid, uh, Natural England might have fallen into is considering these impacts to be only visual and only to do with landscape and visual impact assessment. They refer in the Statement of Common Ground to um, the planning, the, the landscape assessments accompanying the planning applications. Is that it? Is that all we've got? Um, and uh, that isn't enough to assess the setting. There's other ways that aren't landscape, that aren't visual where that could affect the AOMB. So if there's a large amount of new traffic generated by a development that is going to go through the AOMB, that isn't a visual impact. It's an air pollution, tranquility, noise, light pollution issue. Um, if the development means Character that... Character issue, is it? Well, yes. It, it, will harm the, it will also harm the residential enjoyment, the sorry, recreational enjoyment of the AOMB. 
um, when we're on that point, there's also the issue of um, people from uh, within the new development increasing the recreational pressure on the AOMB and making sure that that um, is not going to harm the special uh, habitats and uh, character and history of it. There's also issues of water abstraction for the development. Um, you probably know that the, there's a, we have rare chalk streams within the Chilterns. Uh, we've got nine of, of chalk, chalk streams. They're a very rare habitat. Um, most of them in the world are in southeast England, and we have the largest number in the Chilterns. Um, the River Ver is such a chalk stream, and um, a lot of the water from the River Ver is being abstracted to serve Luton and Dunstaple. Um, we have a chalk streams officer at the board, um, and uh, he did some stats back in February, sorry, January, and he says 44% of the total length of the River Ver is dry. It shouldn't be dry at this time of year. It's an abstraction issue. Um, more development, more water use, more abstraction, more harm to the chalk streams. Another issue is that this water is then treated and not put right back in the right catchment. It is going into the Colne um, and the River Lee, so there's an issue there. Um, air pollution leading to more nitrogen uh, by the roadside, harming plant diversity, leading to things like docks and nettles becoming more predominant and, and harming the chalk grass and species. Loss of tranquility. The effect on rural lanes has already been well covered this morning, and um, I would just encourage you, sir, to, to go along Lily Bottom and to enjoy the um, Chalk Hill Lane and Stony Lane and their particular character as they are now. Um, Lily Bottom Road particularly, I would describe as just an absolutely glorious piece of countryside. With wonderful views, very unspoilt. Um, so yes, the, in all of these ways, the statement of common ground is, is, is flawed between um, Natural England and the Council. It is very partial in what it covers. You picked up very astutely the second sentence, which says um, that the landscape assessments uh, state that allocations can only accommodate, state, sorry, state that this land can only accommodate small scale development. I don't understand why we've been slightly misled a few minutes ago into, into saying, well, that refers to um, the Lily Bottom landscape character area 212. No, it doesn't. This is referring to um, SP19 and landscape character area 202. So, would you um, just bear with me a moment? Yeah. So, yes, landscape character area 202, which is precisely the area where the allocation is cited. Um, the landscape capacity assessment concludes that large, large urban extensions and new settlements would not be entirely appropriate. And if I could read from it, it would be of inappropriate scale and would be likely to result in the coalescence of Luton and the villages and hamlets within Breachwood Green Ridge. Visual impacts could also be high due to the elevated position of the character area on the Ridgeline Plateau, particularly if near the Plateau Edge, and we've heard that the school is likely to be there. Um, increased housing development will be likely to affect the existing narrow twisting lanes, which could erode the character of the landscape. Um, extensive development could also disrupt the rights of way network and could reduce accessibility to the countryside. So it's precisely this area and um, the sustainability appraisal and SEA refer to this, the landscape assessments. The council's own work says that this is not an area in landscape terms that is suitable for large-scale urban extensions. And until quite recently, the council... Sorry, just, just bear with me. Yeah. You know, there is no landscape evidence that says this is okay. There is no new evidence post 2011 apart from to do with the planning applications. There is no evidence base uh, up to date that looks at the uh, combined landscape um, impact of this allocation. Can I just check, um, in the Statement of Common Ground, that the footnote gives me the planning application reference numbers. Um, the, 
do those two applications between them cover the whole of the allocation? Um, I think that was our first question this morning. Um, there was a small area within the land in Bloor Homes ownership that was excluded um, at the very oh, east I of the site. Okay, so, so it's those, cause, because it's, th I ask because it, the site is in, well, it's three sites, in fact, isn't it? EL1, 2, and 3. Between them, they're, they're all of those three, apart from the small parcel, are covered by those two applications. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, those are the same planning application, ref planning application references as in paragraph two of our statement. Um, did I did I cut you off, Miss Murphy? Oh, um, I could go on. Um, I would just like to say that we don't have a statement, a statement of common ground with the council. We weren't asked for one. We would have been very happy to um, see if we had any common ground over this. But um, I think, as as the statutory body responsible for the AOMB and working with councils, we should have been approached. It should have been discussed with us at the earliest stage. It wasn't. Um, Natural England have put this sort of one liner, two liners in at four ten, um, and. It refers to a, a council's own study which says that only small-scale development is appropriate here. Yes, looking back, the 2002 work by Babti, the 2008 work by Land Use Consultants, 2009 work by the Landscape Partnership, the 2011 North Hearts LCA by Babti again, all of those studies say that this area is not suitable for large-scale growth and note the particular character of it. In fact, the Landscape Partnership um, made the uh, easy mistake that they actually referred to this being within the Children's AOMB. Um, it's our contention, as in the application, that this land, the land south and north of the A505, is of equal value. Um, it, they're both within the, the natural area of the chalk, uh, within the same national character area. Um, the, the boundary doesn't follow any natural um, alignment. It is the road. It's arbitrary. Um, there's no discernible difference in the landscape between them, and this is one of the most unspoiled parts of Hertfordshire. The particular timeless quality um, is rare in this part of the country. It's because it's been managed by large estates, and it's managed to avoid having those sort of discordant features I've never seen such a sharp urban rural transition um, as east of the Wigmore estate. You've literally got uh, a suburban housing estate, then a lovely thick hedge, and then beautiful unsport countryside. It is exceptionally rare to find that. And it's because we haven't had the land split up into small ownerships and then in former uses it's, it's retained that quality and well-managed land. Councillor Barnard. Um, um, firstly, uh, I agree with absolutely everything that, uh, that Lucy has said here. M my apologies. Could you um, just bring, bring your microphone yeah, closer? Sorry, <laughs> and, uh, f firstly, I, I, I'd just like to say that I agree with everything that Lucy has said here. Um, I have been a councillor since 1991 um, and therefore uh, was a, a councillor and on the planning committee, etc., uh, when the council approved um, and supported the Children's Conservation Board application to um, increase the size of the AONB to travel along the Mimram Valley, which is Lily Bottom, um, and including the site at the east of Luton. Um, uh, and it just strikes me, so with, with the application, we know that Natural England are, um, are not the fastest people in the world, um, and who knows, the right hand may not necessarily know what the left hand is doing at any one time. Um, but with the current application to redesignate this area, um, it, it, it just seems that it would be premature um, to discount the potential 
um, that this should be AONB because um, when it's gone, it's gone. Um, and, and I really think that uh, this is uh, a premature move. Just because they haven't decided it, let's look at it in another way. They haven't turned it down. Now, um, are, are we talking about the Green Belt as well at the moment, sir? No, not yet. No, fine with that. Um, they're my observations of the AONB, um, and uh, I, I, I'm particularly keen that um, the, the AONB uh, be recognised adjacent to the site. Um, I actually live in Lily Bottom. I have done for 35 years. It is extraordinarily beautiful, even though I live there. Ms. Cotier. Um, yeah, before 2011, the, um, <coughs> the regional, the spatial, region spatial strategy had already um, removed this area from the local plan, saying that it would be unsuitable. And then it made its way back when um, they <coughs> did away with the regional strategy. It came back online again after being kicked out because... Um, Diane to my left here, she spent about 10 years um, fighting having it removed and they were eventually successful. And it came back on. And then I was, um, at the time, we were <coughs> invited to make um, our representations and I was quite surprised to see um, when I was looking through all my old documents some of the old letters that we had to send to North Hearts and then I realised that it was the missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle as to how this came back online again. It turned out after I'd spoken to Councillor Neil Jay from Cockenhoe it came back on via at the time who was the strategic planning officer Richard Kelly and this was the person that we were addressing all our previous um, objections to apparently he had had some hand in bringing this back into the local plan as a possible site so I was quite surprised to see him as one of the developers um, for Crouchake or Crotchake or whatever it's called Crouchase um, on as one of the developers for one of the strategic sites so we had a person who was working within the planning department, managing all the, um, you know, the plans, and he's since become a developer. Um, um, and it was strange for me to see that. Uh, yeah, I just um, for, for your own sake, Ms. Cotier, um, I, I suggest that you go very, very careful with what you say. Uh, right, but it was an observation I made, and it is true. So um, I have to, I have to say that. I, I'm, I'm simply trying to keep you out of trouble. Oh, what kind of trouble? I don't, I don't, I don't understand. What kind of trouble? Uh, if I can help here, sir, um, the uh, the officer in question um, was uh, a well thought of and a hard working um, officer of North Hearts District Council Planning Department. Uh, he left and then went on to the developer. There is no question at all that there was any uh, connection between the two prior to his leaving NHDC. O okay, well, well, thank you for that, that clarification. I mean, it, 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 was just, it sounded like an implication of some kind of wrongdoing. <coughs> okay, so um, moving on then, so um, back to historic England. I was wondering if anybody is aware that um, I don't think they are aware of this, but there was an archaeological um, study done by a man called Stephen Kay, and he um, has put Cockenhoe as only number two uh, um, as one of the likely sites for Boudicca's last battle. Um, there are two lists. One list is including the marches out of London. That means that the army would have marched out of London in the direction, various directions. Um, and they had to take into account things like water supply along the way. And after having done quite a lot of, lot of research, Cockenhoe ended up only as number two um, as one of the possible last battle sites. And although it may sound a bit random, I do want to point out that we have quite a lot of Roman, ancient Roman settlements nearby that area that would suggest it was quite an important site 
back in those days, not least the brick-making factory at uh, was the factory site at Brickham Wood. It was obviously in, um, quite a big thing back in 60 AD to make bricks, so it would have been considered quite a hub. And next door, well, nearby to that area, there is Butterfield Green site, and we, you personally knew Stephen Dyer, who was the archaeologist, what's his name? James Dyer, sorry. James Dyer, who was the archaeologist that wrote, what's that book, Luton Archaeology or something, Luton Archaeology. Um, and he was the main authority of archaeology in the area. And it was a very sad story because he put this stuff all in his book, that Butterfield Green, they uncovered the largest Roman ruin in the whole of England there. But they... For some reason, I don't know, he didn't make the case very well or he didn't communicate. They went straight through and dug it up and put Butterfield Green on top of it. But if it was indeed the largest Roman ruin in the whole country, that would suggest a pretty large settlement once existed there, along with the brick-making factory. So this idea that perhaps it was an ancient battle site seems to be um, supported by that because she would have come in and targeted a really large um, community of Romans rather than just a small one and her last battle would have been quite a big endeavour. So there are other, um, in earlier documents, I found quite a lot of archaeological studies that were not mentioned in the later um, documents relating to this plan and um, there were quite a lot of sites of interest dotted around EL um, 1, 2 and 3, but I didn't find them in the later documents. But I did put them in my earlier objections for the, um, out, the, the local plans consultation, um, but I mentioned them in my local plan objection, although I didn't give, provide the map for those. Um, but they were, all, they were littered across the whole two fields and beyond. And behind the airport was also Dane Street, which was the boundary for um, De uh, the Anglo-Saxons and the Danes that invaded. So the area was not just an insignificant spot, taking all that into account. So I think there's some heritage beneath the soils there. And under um, Wigmore Valley Park, which is... The, the landfill, which is now the site they want to dug up. Roman ruins were also discovered there as well. And um, one question I, I would like to follow up on, which, because it comes from an earlier hearing day, and I looked on the examination library to try and find if this document had been um, uploaded and it, it had not yet but on week three of your list of actions for North Hearts Council um, we asked them to provide a map that um, illustrates the safeguarded area relating to the aerodrome because this was affecting what they could and couldn't put regarding drainage in that area and I looked to see if it was there um, and it was a statutory requirement that they did this, and you mentioned it as um, on page four of your list of actions for week three. I can't find it, so is that not there, or am I missing something? It's, it hasn't been um, uploaded onto the website yet, no. Drainage is quite a problem on that site. They've got people drilling over there at the moment, and I had a talk with some of them, and they told me because it's agricultural land, um, it, it's very um, difficult to know how it's going to react to water, and they know it's a waterlogged area, so they're drilling down right now to find out. But we can, we, we, can, we know that it's um, an area that suffers with drainage problems because it's clay-based, and... Uh, 10 inches of water to gather on the road at the, at the point, well, the boundary between Luton and 
Hertfordshire, there's a spot there that becomes like a lake, and then further up into Cocono, that also becomes like a lake during when it rains. So we know just from observing that that it's got a drainage issue, and if you put houses on top, that will affect drainage even more. So this issue of suds and urban drainage schemes is a very important thing to address. And it, they have said that within the safeguarded <coughs> aerodrome map, you can't place um, suds above the soil. They would only be able to go beneath the soil. And that's um, it's a requirement to Annex 3 of the directive called, I can tell you it again, I did mention it, the Town and Country Planning Safeguarded Aerodromes Technical Sites and Military Explosives Storage Areas Direction 2002. And they've got a requirement in that that says you have to provide this map as part of your local plan. Um, yes, well, um, just to answer the point, it's on, it's on the list of actions um, to, to be done. Um, you've, you've stopped very suddenly, Ms. Cottier. Is there, have, you, have you done? Well, I, I just put everything together because you said you wanted... You know, yeah, no, that's, that, that's great. I'm just checking. I, I didn't want to move on before you'd finished. That was all. There are, um, yeah, there are uh, um, some corn buntings in the area, the birds, there's corn. Um, you, you have full details of, as from um, one of, on the, I can't remember the lady's name, but there's a full list of <coughs> types of wildlife that are found within the East Luton sites. Um, there are some newts, apparently, um, according to one of the searches. Can, do you, are you familiar with what statement I'm referring to, or do you want me to look it up now and give you the name of the person that submitted it? I, I can't remember the name of the person. Okay, um, hearing objection. Uh, I have to kind of find if, if it, it. No, it, it, something it's been put in. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. I wouldn't need to know the name of the person now. No, it's not. It's not. Not to zero. It's one of the East Luton. Ones. It was the East Luton Wildlife and it was about wildlife and protected species, and the, all the different birds that were there were, were listed. So we do have red kites there, and I was um, there. <coughs> they're a protected species, and under the wild uh, the red kite is listed under Schedule One of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. 1981 and has full legal protection and under that act the welfare of the bird always has to come first so it's actually a criminal offence to disturb nesting kites um, and they're extremely sensitive to human activity close to nesting areas especially in nesting seasons because they'll abandon their nests and chicks at the slightest disturbance and um, a lot of the residents who I'm supposed to be helping relay messages from they've observed lots of kites in the area there were at least four talking about it to me this week um, saying yeah we've seen them um, they're there and it's a documented fact that they are there and I think the children board also knows about this and the, the, the society for birds also and bluebells are in the woods as well and they're also protected by the wildlife and countryside act 1981 so all of that is part of that general area. Um, we've also got the corn buntings, which are protected, I think. And the, there was presence in one of the statements for this session east of Luton, the one that um, she talks about the presence of some kind of reptiles, which I think are probably... Uh, no, they were actual reptiles. There's actually reptiles in... One of the sites, it's on um, the database for, I think it was Natural England's uh, database. I, I'd have to look up her statement. It's been submitted to you. You'll know the one that it is, but it, there are um, 
specially protected reptiles in within this area, and it's most likely the newts, I would say, because it would have because they're the really protected ones, and I think gold crested newts are the ones that are really protected, very rare. So they're within the area as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll be dealing with green green belt um, afterwards. Um, Mr. Wood. Um, uh, just carrying on from where that left off, actually. We, we've done quite a few surveys in that area over the last few months. Um, it is quite diverse in biodiversity terms. Um, what I'm really talking about are the badgers. We've found quite um, significant badger implications in that area. <clears throat> Box um, brick kiln wood has got at least four sets that we know of. Um, can, both of um, which can border... I, can, Mr. Wood, can I, can I just ask um, that, that you not be too specific about the location of yes, Badger it, Sets. It's something I was going to mention, actually. We've got all the coordinates for these things, and we do protect our sets quite rigorously um, because there are people out, still out there doing nefarious activities, um, lamping and that sort of thing. Um, but that, that's why I asked that you're <coughs> not specific. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, a group was done for badger baiting just a few weeks ago, you know, which, uh, which is quite rare to get convictions for that sort of thing, but uh, one was brought and it was successful. Um, so we've, we've got badger implications. There's uh, latrines being found um, all over the site. Um, so we know that uh, latrines are often a s mark out the boundary of, of the badgers, where the badgers live. Badgers live in a quite close-knit community, um, often known as a clan. And, in fact, they couldn't have been there for many generations. You know, the same clan can live in the same area. And we'll mark the boundaries with latrines. Latrines have been found all over the place. Badger paths, they always tend to use the same paths because they can't see very well in the dark. And they go leave a scent trail. And they'll always follow the same scent trail when they go out and come back. So budget paths are a, a sure sign that badgers are around. Um, there's badgers in the ad adjacent wood. It's not actually in, inside the area that's um, allocated. Um, and that's quite... Uh, it's on the ridge, actually, overlooking... overlooking um, what's the name of the road? The little road down the bottom? Lily. Lily, Lily Bottom. It's overlooking Lily Bottom. They're, they're, they're quite, uh, quite active, not far away. Um, so we've got quite a lot of budget activity. Really need to do a full survey of the area to make sure that um, we've got everything logged where it is. Um, budgets are highly protected. Um, any heavy digging shouldn't be done within... Although the, the rules have changed from Natural England... They, they used to say 30 metres. Now they say close, which could be... And we interpret, interpret that as 30 metres or more because um, they are very easily disturbed. Um, so we, we, we have got concerns with the, with the development. Um, I hope it does get, uh, get onto the... Uh, a or N B list um, because I, I think that area does deserve that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Baker. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to return to landscape because that's where it started as it was going mm. around the table. But on landscape, first of all, I'd like to support um, I think everything that's been said by. Um, Lucy Murphy for the Conservation Board and particularly in terms of why this area is in, important and in terms of why um, I think 
she and I and our um, campaign are concerned about the contradiction between the council's long-standing support for inclusion of this area, the whole of this area in the um, AONB, um, because it has supported it. Just to say they're, they're going to support a review, I mean, what's the objective of the review if it's not to include that area within the AONB? I'd like to see the original committee report, anything in the original committee report that proposed it as to why councillors at the time didn't think it uh, had any reservations about whether it should be included or not. Well, what, I, what, I, um, <coughs> what I'm therefore very disappointed about is why the, the way that the councillors selective, selectively uh, attempted to use the evidence of their own studies to justify what is clearly a development that would compromise the, the landscape of the area. And the guidelines for this area, which have a long standing and which the council don't say are um, out of date, the, in the, the, the list of guidelines at the back of um, the Breachwood Green Ridge assessment, in other words, CG16, which we've been looking at, um, I'm, I'm really surprised that at paragraph 49, which is actually interestingly in the green belt section of the council statement, it talks about the proposal being, I think it says, broadly in line with the guidelines of the assessment. Well, I think they've been reading that assessment in, in a totally different way to um, the, how, uh, what, what the, the normal English of that those guidelines mean. And I'd invite you, sir, to... To, to spend, I know uh, that it might take at least half a minute to actually read those guidelines and draw your own conclusions about whether or not this development is consistent with those guidelines, because we don't certainly don't think they can be. Um, I won't repeat any of the quotes that uh, have been uh, read out by Ms. Murphy, but I but I would just like to to uh, refer to two, and that is that um, the comment in the, um, I think it's the East of Luton landscape report, which talks about the strong contrast of the area with Luton. And I think the, the, the implications of that can't be understated. It is a remarkable change of character at the boundary with Luton. And, and when you you visit the area, so you, you may visit it from different directions at different times, but I would urge you to to travel from the Offley area, which is on the edge, very close to the edge of the AONB as it now stands. Go down uh, Lily Bottom Road and down to the road and then up the hill to Cock and Ho and pass through Cock and Ho and I challenge you to get... Um, uh, as to when you suddenly realise you've actually reached Luton, because all of a sudden you reach it at a very firm boundary uh, uh, along an edge which is remarkably unspoilt by what you often get in terms of urban fringe paraphernalia. That doesn't exist along that stretch of boundary, which gives that area... It, you, you do suddenly go from town to country and a tranquil rural area and then very soon to the, the, the small, I, hasten to, I don't like to use the word villages because they're hardly big enough to call villages. I know combining, council combining cock and hoe and mangrove green kind of almost makes them the size of a... They're very small communities with a, their own distinctive character that the council's assessment would be threatened by large-scale development. And, and they are fa uh, factors which contribute to a quality of landscape that, again, sir, I, you will form your own view about, but you, you will understand why the whole of this area is being considered as an extension to the ONB. And, and that I think you will also agree that visual in impact would be high, as said in the council's assessment, 
due to the elevated position of the character area on a ridgeline plateau. And, and all of those conclusions, I think you'll find, are, are right. And, and that you will conclude that it, it's a great, it would be a great shame to compromise that area before there's been a proper opportunity to consider whether or not it should be subject to more st strict protection under the, um, uh, as a, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, there are other there are other aspects of that which are which are obviously related, including the other impacts on the character of that area in terms of, of activity, um, transport in particular. Um, but I think um, I, th I think one of the fa one of the reasons why. There is, there is a kind of anomaly in terms of talking about the, um, char the, the value of the area in landscape terms and distinguishing between the, air, the area 202, which is the, the Breachwood Green Ridge, and the adjacent character area of, the, of, of Lily and Lily Bottom, the area 212. I think one of the reasons is because of the geological and geomorphological characteristics where we are effectively on the Chilterns, on the dip slope of the Chilterns, you've, you have elongated character areas which are different in the valleys from the plateaus between them. And, those, and that, the orientation of those is northwest to southeast. Now, the unfortunate thing about the Breachwood Green Ridge, after from the, it, it runs down from close to the A505, along the edge of Luton and then south eastwards. But it's un very unfortunate, and as it passes the end of Luton, it hits Luton, Air Luton Airport. So it's not surprising that the character of parts of the gr that, r that uh, character area, which, are, which is a narrow one, are considered to be of lesser landscape value. And if you, and if you add in all the various elements of considerations on different parts of that ridge, I think you might conclude that parts of it have a lesser value than, say, the Lily Bottom, more uh, valley-based um, landscape area to the next to it. But that doesn't mean that this part of the ridge is, doesn't have a, an important landscape character in its own right. And I haven't seen a, a study which effectively um, d distances this or separates out in terms of for the local plan there may have been one done for the planning applications I don't know I haven't looked at them but if for the in preparation for the local plan which demonstrates that this area is a significantly low lower quality than the adjacent area and in that regard I think there's a that's why there is this discrepancy between what the council is saying in terms of well this isn't a particularly important landscape area but the landscape study which says and concludes that it has a very low well a low capacity for large scale residential development um, which clearly in to my mind is a reasonable conclusion and means that this development shouldn't really be taking place here um, and I have no doubt in my own mind that at the end of the process, that at some stage in the process, conclusion will be reached that this, this area does have similar qualities to the area to the north, which is in the AONB, and should be protected. And it would be a, a great shame if the opportunity for that, um, particularly for the area of the plateau, which is proposed to be development here, is, um, is already lost. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Ms. Hamilton. If I could just add two points <clears throat> from a resident's point of view. Okay, so basically, the trouble is, w w we know we need housing, affordable housing, but the problem with the, the problem with the Luton area is, if you was to stand on top of Farley Hill or Wardown Hill and you used to look out yonder, many, many moons ago, you'd be able to see sort of countryside in the distance. 
If you stand on these hills now and look out, it's like looking at mini London. You've basically got a huge sprawl of Luton. It joins onto Dunstable. It joins onto Houghton Regis. We have central beds putting in 4,000 homes in the north of Luton, where there is some nice countryside and 20 hectares of employment land. So really, basically, what I'm saying is the east of Luton is the one unspoiled bit of countryside which is like juxtaposed with little woodlands. It's got a huge amount of biodiversity and it's accessible for the residents of Luton. It's that one place where you can go into open countryside and for the mental benefits, you know, mental health, physical health, it's somewhere that people can go and access this open, beautiful place. So many of us do believe it should be under the AOMB. Um, one other point... Um, as I've said, it's, it's inhabited by a variety of wildlife. Um, to say that an area like this wouldn't have a negative impact on biodiversity is absolutely, utterly ridiculous because we would see a loss of foraging for the badgers. We would see uh, the woodlands that um, many of the species inhabit would be sort of under pressure from residents and from rubbish, what comes with the residents, etc., etc. Lots more traffic on the roads. So it would have a really negative impact. Um, as you know, there's only a couple of sites in the whole plan we're really against, and Luton is one of those plans. Um, yeah, we just we think it should be able to go onto AOMB and be left as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Hamilton. Anything else from anyone else um, on the question of um, environmental constraints and likely impacts of the development? Because what I'll do, if there is here, those, those sort of final comments, then ask the council for its final comment and then, and then move on on my agenda. No takers. So, do you want us to respond now, or, or wait? Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take you just before the council. Okay. <coughs> no. <coughs> Mr. White. Uh, could I perhaps ask um, colleague here, Elizabeth Fry, to respond first, principally on landscape and visual matters, and then I'll try and mop up the other issues that have been raised. Wait a minute, um, Ms. Cotier. Following on from what Nikki said about how it's respite for the residents, um, it's not just um, something that we, we are very attached to that area and it's not something we're attached just because it looks nice, but we actually need it for our survival because it's um, the only place that we can get oxygen from and the, um, the problem of getting oxygen is projected to become even more difficult and we need oxygen to live. Um, and green space standards in um, Luton are deficit currently. And the Luton local plan knows this. And in the Luton local plan, you can see a chart on page 151, which summarises the typology of green space for us in Luton and gives you um, the current requirement um, and what the current deficit is for us in Luton and just to give you some idea amenity green space should be 82.1 hectares but we've only got 54.1 which is a deficit of 28.04 and we're about to lose our park on top of that so in terms of seeking balanced outcomes for um the economic needs of the council, but also the sustainability and well-being of the communities. I think it's a good compromise to allow the area of outstanding natural beauty to be passed so that we can protect that area in exchange for what we're going to have to absorb from the expansion of the airport, which is going to bring economic um, in economic benefits to the town apparently and that seems to be a fair payoff otherwise we've had everything taken from us in that area and 
that simply I th is, is unacceptable because we're a large area. We deserve to be able to access green space just like anybody else in the country and we shouldn't be imprisoned within walls of urban sprawl just so that we can somehow say, oh, we've built 2,000 houses for Luton's unmet needs because housing needs are not the only needs that we have to think about here. And before there are houses, we have to breathe. And if we no longer... If we no longer have any trees to produce the oxygen, where is the oxygen going to come from? It won't come from anywhere. And we'll be poisoned. And the air quality is already bad enough as it is without making it worse. So I think it's about striking a balance between allowing the progression of the airport responsibly so that it can benefit the town economically. And that's what the council and their company, London Luton Airport, and the operating company have all said that they don't want this to conflict with the economic interests. And yet, on the other hand, the people in that area also have interests. So it seems to me a logical balance to draw the line at the boundary and say, OK, we've got houses come online now in the west and north of Luton, um, we've also got empty houses. We've just found 800 empty houses in um, Luton that we can make up that numbers from other areas that when they were set did not exist as an opportunity, but now they do, and leave that stretch of land the way it is so that, you know, that every, I feel then that's a balanced compromise. Uh, anything be other than that, I don't feel it's fair on the people that are already there, me being one of them. And I represent the views of all the people on my mailing list, four, five hundred, and we, we're growing every day. There's 1,500 on a Facebook page. Everybody's worried about this. So that's why I'm here, representing those views, because many of the people can't come because they've got jobs and they're working, and I'm supposed to be doing that too, but haven't been, as you know. I do. Thank you, Ms. Cotier. Uh, Ms. Fry. Um, just picking up on a few of the matters um, or issues that have been raised. Um, first of all, the AUMB is not um, adjacent to the site. Um, if I can just point you to the direction of Bloor's Appendix D, Figure 5.4. That's a 10 statement. landscape designations plan. Yep. Um, and that you'll see on the on the on the uh, key there, um, about halfway down the Chilton's AOMB is the vertical hatch. Um, so you can see the extent of that north of uh, lies north of the A505, some distance from um, the sites. Um, if you then turn to figure 5.6, um, which shows um, the sites and then distance radii from that, so the AOMB is some two kilometres from the northern perimeter of the sites. Um, viewpoint 12 to the right at the top of the plan is within, has been taken within um, the AOMB itself from public footpath, um, which is shown if you turn to figure 5.13. Viewpoint 12 from public right-of-way Lily 004 um, demonstrates clearly the ridge line looking from the northwest. Um, the strongly planted ridge line and the, the, the site is not visible. None of the sites are visible from, that, from within the AOMB. And then just moving on onto landscape character. And the Breachwood 
screen. Sorry, bear with me a moment. Sorry. Yep. Uh, CG16, landscape character 202, Breachwood Green Ridge. Just coming back to that. Yep, sorry, bear with me. Page 48. 48. Uh, well, which states that, as we've already heard, that the, the landscape is of more, has been assessed as moderate to low landscape value. And then page 48C um, recognises uh, the strategy, the, the, the character area falls within the strategy to improve and restore the character. So which page was of that area? Page 48C. So the strategy for that character area is to improve and restore. Um, and the development of the sites provides uh, opportunity to deliver several of the landscape management guidelines and built development guidelines. Including items, um, or specifically, uh, such as maintaining and extending the rights of way network with all existing all existing public rights of way being integrated within the development and planting of appropriate broad broadleaf woodland and vegetation to screen new development as well as avoid, avoiding the location of new development in visual intrusive locations, such as on the edges of the plateau, where they would be visible on currently undeveloped skylines. And then just going back to figure 5.14, of the matter 10 statement. Viewpoint 15. Uh, figure 5.14, yes. Yep. Viewpoint 15. Yep. Uh, that demonstrates the, the screening of the site from along, uh, well, from the lily bottom, from the road um, to the east of the site. Um, and that demonstrates the strong, strongly wooded uh, ridge line which screens, screens the sites from that location. Degree of natural natural screening that exists. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, sir. Um, quite a lot of things raised. I'll try and respond to them quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you will bear in mind, of course, that um, it's, it's the council's job to uh, respond to the point. Or clarify, based Thank on you. our knowledge. Um, I suppose a point I made perhaps earlier that um, in response to the issue of pressure on the AOMB, well, this housing is for Luton's need, and given that the AOMB wraps around Luton, if the housing was to be anywhere in Luton, you could argue there'd be an increased pressure on the AUNB. It's not a specific point to this site. Plus, there's no evidence submitted to say that that would be the case. Um, in terms of water abstraction and um, pressure on the chalk streams, um, 
our uh, surface water drainage strategy um, is for recharge of the aquifer, um, which has been agreed with the Environment Agency through deep bore soakaways, and there will actually be a moderately beneficial effect on the underlying aquifer. Sorry, just, uh, just Sorry. bear with me, Mr. Mr. Wright. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I um, got it that, um, that your, your strategy is um, recharging of the aquifer. It's the aquifer that feeds the chalk streams. Yeah. Um, as Miss Muffet's point about the river being dried up. Oh, no, I understand the point. Yeah. I just didn't hear what you said sorry, afterwards. Apologies. Apologies. Um, so we'll actually have a beneficial effect on the aquifer recharge. And indeed, we have to include for on site storage to slow down that recharge so that we don't. Um, increase any um, sort of spring groundwater flooding elsewhere. And you mentioned the um, Environment Agency. I, I didn't catch that point. Uh, well, th the strategy has been um, agreed with the Environment Agency and their um, response to the planning applications um, acknowledges that. They have no objection to what we're proposing. And equally, that there will be additional biodiversity benefits associated with all the new suds that we'll be putting in as part of that strategy. In terms of um, rights of way and access to countryside and public open space, um, the application includes for uh, increases in public rights of way. We'll be introducing new public rights of way to join up some of the footpaths. We'll be improving some of the footpaths and bridleways. And through the development, There'll be circa 50% of which will be green infrastructure. There'll be something like 47 hectares of public open space. That's truly accessible public open space, so that's where there's currently farm fields that may or may not have a footpath around them. It'll become fully accessible public open space. So in response to Ms. Um, Hamilton's point, we will actually be providing for a lot of the deficit in that part of Luton in terms of access to public open space. Okay, we just um, I need to be a bit careful um, here sir. again because this is um, getting into the detail of the application that isn't necessarily in the plan that, um, that I'm examining. Apologies, sir. I suppose one point on the AOMB itself um, is one has to consider why, if this vast, amount, vast area of landscape that's currently being proposed as part of the extension to the AOMB, both to the east and west of Luton, why that was never included in the first place when the AOMB was designated? AOMB is supposed to be areas of outstanding natural beauty. I presume they took great care when originally designating them, but chose not to include any of the areas that are currently being put forward. There's also the issue that Natural England has reported to ourselves when we inquired about this, um, take a fairly dim view if they feel any of the applications are in any way to try and prevent development. And if you looked at the application as a whole, including to the east of Luton and the west of Luton, across central beds, it's hard to see where new housing growth could go if it all came out and became AONB. Ms. Cotier then raised the spectre of Cockenhoe being Boudicca's last battle site and various references to Roman settlements. Without going into the details, sir, we've been umpteen archaeological surveys across the area, all agreed with the county archaeologists, including geophys, trial trenching and all the rest of it. And the principal findings are as is well known, that there was Roman 
activity in brick kiln wood associated with excavating clay to make bricks. Full stop. I suppose whilst on that point as well and before addressing some of the ecology points, of course the allocation itself, never mind our application, specifically excludes the large woodland areas. The line goes around them to protect them. So regardless of the proposals we've put in, which seek to enhance them, they will be protected in any event. In terms of the various species and things that were referred to, I think um, as Cotier was referring to the submission by Mr Michael Dines, all that is is simply a, a record search of um, Natural England records, which you'll see when you look at it are extremely coarse. They're based on kilometre grid squares. You won't be surprised to hear me say we've surveyed this site for 10 years for all manner of protected species, including badgers. There are no great crested newts on site, sir. There are badgers. They are in the woods. But as I've said, the woods are excluded from the allocation. And in our proposals are um, well buffered by at least 30 metres. And of course, we incorporate the additional green infrastructure I've referred to. Hence, the bluebells in the wood will be protected too. In terms of all those surveys, they've been kept up to date, fully up to date in accordance with and in liaison with um, the Wildlife Trust and County Ecologist. I'll leave it that way. Right now, you see, I have asked people, haven't I, if they've told me everything. Very briefly, very, very briefly, Mr Baker. Um, yes, sir. Uh, oh, sorry. I can't let Mr White get away with that. Bluebells don't move. Badgers do. Um, the, all of that surrounding land is important for, for, for foraging of the ba badgers. The woodland is the location of the sets. Um, and if you put a fence around it to stop people, the, the new people who are going to live all around it from destroying it, you're going to stop the badgers getting out. They're just the two large-scale housing surrounding woodland with badger sets in is not, a, is not a good recipe for good planning, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what was going on there. But, um, <laughs> is, is Mr Wood still allowed to speak? Or is no, because you've said that point. Same thing. Uh, okay. But at the end of the day, with the fact of the woodland is whether you've got a buffer or not, are you going to be there every week to take all the sticks out of the holes and stop the persecution? It's that simple. You can't just pick up this biodiversity and the bats and the badgers and move them elsewhere. You know, they've lived there for generations and generations. You know, it's not for us to just say, clear off out, we're moving in. It's simple as that. Thanks, Lamoles. Um, I don't know if I to the herd that roam the land um, they haven't been mentioned and um, it's no, there's nothing more beautiful than seeing areas of outstanding natural beauty with herds of deer um, and they've not been mentioned and immediately houses go on areas where there's woodland they won't go there they'll be too scared and the destruction of wild animals once you get large communities around isn't very nice. Dogs run loose, etc., and they'll be hounded. Thank you, Miss Cotier. Yeah, <coughs> and that, the, what he said about there's the only archaeological site is Brickham Wood is completely and utterly incorrect there are at least 15 other sites within those boundaries that um, are, in pre are in archaeological studies um, that were done prior to theirs. And that's a well-documented fact, and I can provide the names and dates of those studies if it's required. And it's 
one no way. Ms. Murphy. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to come back to, on Mr. White's point about chalk streams. Um, the implication was that actually the aquifer is going to be better off after this development. Um, I, I really don't think so, I'm afraid. Uh, we, at the moment, it's farmland, and um, the rainwater clearly recharges the aquifer in a natural and normal way. After the development, um, it's going to be uh, road washings and roof washings going down into the aquifer, not quite so clean. And anyway, the water I was talking about that's being lost from the burr is water for water supply, so the water that comes out of the taps, nothing to do with um, whether or not you're returning the uh, rainwater to the aquifer. So, that, yes, a tiny amount back that way. The water supply is the issue. Um, the River Ver, anyway, is west of Luton, not east of Luton. This is not um, the same catchment. Um, and just on the point that implied that we're trying to uh, extend the AOMB to the west of Luton, no, that's not the case. This is the site um, that is uh, proposed in the Central Beds local plan as a sort of location of growth is, is not in the AOMB, and it's not in one of the areas that we have um, asked to be in the AOMB. Um, the area north of Luton, where um, there is proposed large housing employment and a new road, is partly in the AOMB, so the, the link road would actually be in the AOMB, um, which obviously we're very concerned about. And if I could just come back to on um, Ms Fry's points, uh, uh, she explained as if it made it okay that um, this, this isn't adjacent, the AOMB is not adjacent to this site just shows the lack of understanding about the setting of the AOMB, pointing out to us, oh, it's, it's more than two kilometres away. Two kilometres is well within the setting of the AOMB. That's a very short distance. Um, and the landscape character points about um, LCA 202. I really don't think that um, building over 2,000 homes is going to improve and restore this landscape character area. And I really don't see how um, this large-scale proposal meets the built development guidelines and I'm sorry, sorry just, just bear with me a moment. Just questioning this improve and restore. And, um, finally, the, the point that the rights of na way network is going to be maintained... Well, yes, but at the moment we've got the Chiltern Cycleway passing along delightful rural sunken <coughs> lanes, and we've got the Chiltern Way, one of our main strategic footpaths, passing through farmland and woodland. Instead, those paths and cycleway will be going through uh, a, a housing estate. I don't think that is um, <coughs> improving, maintaining it. Thank you. Are you indicating, Ms. Crossier? I want to give you the reference of the document that I've just found on one of my old memory sticks. <clears throat> to back up what I said about there being many archaeological sites dotted across the whole zone. Yep. So the name, I originally got this report from North Hearts District's web own website. I don't know whether it's still up there, but the name of the document and its reference number is Cotswold. Archaeological Trust. One zero 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 two one zero nine Brick Kiln Project. Project number two nine three five. In there are many sites, six recorded cultural heritage sites on one section of the land, two Roman and prehistoric sites, including Iron Age pottery, nine post-medieval sites, eight medieval sites, 16 undated, that's on one section. On the other section, there are six recorded cultural heritage sites. 17 are undated. One is prehistoric. 
and it's evidenced by a small accumulation of Neolithic flints recorded 100 metres to the north of the site. There's 18 further undated sites, 11 post-medieval, further 10 post-medieval, and over the entirety of mangrove green, rudge and furrow has been identified from aerial photo photographs, um, three Roman sites, and they're all listed in that, and you can... You, would, you can see maps in the, that site, uh, in that uh, document. If for any reason it's been taken down and you are unable to get a copy, I can provide it to you, but I don't want to bombard you with unwelcome documents, but I have a record of it if nobody else does. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Moles. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't um, For the council? Final comment? Um, I think when the council stopped, we were still on landscape. But, um, Pardon? I think when the council stopped, we were still on landscape. So um, I don't want to obviously take too much time. Obviously, you have our written comments on um, in our statement on you know, the potential impacts and um, the things we've looked at covering the council's view on ecology, heritage, so forth. I'm not going to rehearse them at length no. here. Um, just a couple of points that I did want to, to pick up on, and one was actually just a point of broader context. Here. If I could just direct you to page 17 of the plan itself. Of the actual plan? The actual plan. Let's open the actual plan. Well, just for the novelty, I will yes. do that. Um, and if we can bring ourselves to sort of rewind ourselves a good eight hours, where um, somewhere at the outset either you or I, um, made the point that the principal purpose of this proposed allocation was to help meet unmet needs from Luton, and it was just to direct you to the map of the housing market areas in figure three and just remind ourselves that the extent to which North Hertfordshire is within the Luton housing market area and therefore the extent of the area in which it can look to make a contribution to those unmet needs is relatively small. Obviously, within that area, we have the AONB. You can just about make out on that map the numbers 505 beneath the A505 as it comes out of the yellow area into the green area. Half the area of the HMA in which we might look. And in that context, and, and having regard to see paragraph 14 of the MPPF in terms of balanced planning judgments. Um, I think it's just important to sort of remember that I say that context of the area in which we can look and also the, the sort of comparative analysis of how that area may compare with other sites in the housing market area which may be able to make contributions to the market area's housing needs. And the specific point which I guess that leads on to is I know Ms Murphy raised the question of whether the council effectively had considered landscape any further beyond the studies that Mr Billingsley took us through at the outset and it was just to um, identify that obviously we participate in the um, Luton Growth Study which is from 2016 and if I could just ask Mr Grantham behind me from Land Use Consultants who conducted that study on behalf of all the housing market area partners just to specifically identify how landscape was taken into account in that and also um, just to sort of flag up what they did in terms of comparative analysis of, of other constraints because I think it's informative. It potentially lapses slightly into your later question on reasonable alternatives but I think while we're at this point it may just be helpful if Mr Grantham could address those points. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief but we do need to just turn to document HOU7 is the growth option study.
Um, and in particular, to start with Appendix 1 in, in that, and as, as you'll turn into that, sir, the, the, we, we looked at 31 locations across the housing market area in the growth options study, one of which, um, location L22, is the uh, location that's been discussed um, today. Um, in Appendix 1, those that summarises how we dealt with various um, environmental constraints, and there was a distinction uh, was drawn between primary constraints and secondary constraints. Um, primary constraints are, as you recognise, largely reflect national designations, historic biodiversity, uh, landscape, the AOMB. That, um, uh, at the first stage in the study, was excluded from consideration as a location for housing to meet uh, Luton's unmet, unmet need. We then secondly looked uh, at secondary considerations and uh, locally identified sensitive landscapes fell within that. Because um, we were dealing with four, four authorities who um, form all or part of the housing market area, Luton, Aylesbury Vale, North Hearts, Central Beds, the interpretation of local designations differs slightly between each plan, as, as you appreciate. Um, so we took a very cautious view. Um, uh, we took the, the higher locally designated landscapes in terms of their sensitivity to change, and that was based on available data, landscape assessments prepared by the various authorities. In this particular case, we, we noted that a very small part of the location that we were assessing fell within one of the higher categories of landscape sensitivity in North Hertfordshire. Hence, we, uh, we recorded that as it affecting a secondary landscape constraint. And at that point, I'd like to turn to refer you to table 3.1 in the growth options document, which is on page 19. Um, that's a, a summary of the secondary constraints across the, all the topics that we looked at um, and based on the classifications that I referred to in Appendix 1. If you look towards the middle, uh, there's a column headed locally identified sensitive landscape. The point I want to make here is that of the 31 sites that we, sorry, locations that we considered um, as being uh, possible or having the potential to meet the unmet housing need in Luton, um, 24 of them overlapped to a greater or lesser extent um, they didn't have to fall entirely within the designation. They just had to overlap, and in, in this case, only a very small part overlaps with the higher sensitivity class classifications within the policies of the respective four authorities. So um, wherever you look for sites, sorry, locations for um, meeting the housing need across the housing market area, more often than not, 24 of the 31 locations, you encounter a secondary landscape designation. That, that is just a, a fact, uh, and it, it is a reality of, of the characteristics of the wider housing market area. Um, the final point I'd like to sorry, make... Bear, bear with me. Sorry. sorry. Part of the um, methodology we adopted, which was necessarily strategic, that was the nature of the study, um, we did look at each individual location with the, the four planning authorities to see whether the, uh, the starting area that we, could, we were given should be either expanded or um, reduced in size. And if I can turn you to table 2.2 in, in the option study, which is on page 3... 
starts on, 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 three, on page three, but actually the site is, is listed on page four, L22. Um, we discussed with officers at North Hertfordshire whether or not this area could be increased in size. Sorry, did you say in the growth study? In the growth study, yes. Sorry, page uh, three. Page three, yes. Oh, sorry. There is, sorry, it's, I've got an error in page number. Can I, sorry, paragraph 2.22, sir. Sorry, my mistake. My pagination is wrong. Do you say it was table 2? Yeah, table 2.2. Table two, two. And it's, it's just below paragraph uh, well, 2.22. It, it is on a page 3, but there are more than one. Yeah, there's, there seems to be a, yes. a, a problem with the way this has been printed. Um, do you have the right table now, sir? I do, yes. What, what, what this um, table summarises is the exercise that we went through with each authority for every location to see whether or not uh, the areas that we started with could be expanded or reduced in size, obviously uh, to see um, uh, what the housing yield would be to meet the unmet need. You turn over the page remaining in, in Table 2.2 to L22, which is, is the site East Luton, we discussed with officers expanding uh, the allocated area in our location to the east, um, but it was concluded um, in part for landscape reasons, but also um, other sensitivities to do with the historic environment, for Register Park and Garden, which is nearby and so on, that um, it shouldn't be any larger than it is. I, I only draw your attention to this in that um, it, it is indicative, I think it's evidence that consideration has, or certainly through the option study, was given to landscape sensitivity at a high level, necessarily, um, and the area was, was held back, constrained, uh, in part for landscape reasons. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Yeah. It, it was simply, sir, just to draw your attention to, um, you were taken to um, figure 5.6 in the Bloor Home submission, and um, Ms. Fry um, took you to the various um, viewpoints, but it, it, it I, I just suggest if you have a look at figure 5.6. If you bear with me, can I, can I put um, this one away? You may. <laughs> figure 5.6. Six, yes. three, four, five, yep. so, and you'll see there, if you look in the key, that um, there's a brown hatched area that's marked, and it's the approximate extent of visual em envelope. Yeah. And you'll see at the bottom, uh, it's a concept you'll be familiar with, sir, you'll see at the bottom there's an explanation as to what the visual envelope is. And um, you'll, you'll be able to see from that that the extent of the visual em envelope is is pretty contained. When one bears in mind the uh, the boundary of the AONB, and obviously this is one of the documents that the um, Natural England would have had in front of it when it um, entered into the statement of common ground. Beyond that, sir, um, we, we do deal with all the points, um, as Mr. Smith has explained, uh, in, our, in our statement. Um, and I think we'd simply just be repeating ourselves if we just go back through that. I'm not sure that's really going to 
to serve any useful purpose. No, I wouldn't want to do that. likely to complete today. Given that well, we sir, I suppose it, it's very difficult for us to, huh. um, to, to, to gauge that. Um, we've obviously been um, fairly short in um, what we've said to you. It, it, it really does depend on um, how long um, the um, other uh, representations um, or the representors want to, want to take how long they want to take on all of this. Um, it's quarter to six. Yes, I've just noticed. Um. Um, yes, well, I'm also mindful that we're, um, we'll shortly move, to, move on to green belt, and, and then, so, well, which ties in with settlement boundary. We're not going to finish, are we? Well, we, we will, I assume, finish. It's simply a question of <laughs> Um, yes, well, I, I, I don't mind saying I'm with, with you on that. Um, yeah, um, I think I'm going to call it um, a, a day um, for, for now, um, which means that we will have to um, find a slot in the reserve time that is on the timetable um, to complete two days' session. Um, I'm not, not going to um, decide what date that is now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to um, Ms. Sinjin Howe and um, to the council as well, um, and uh, that, that'll be posted up on the website um, in, in due course. Um, can I just ask a question, sir? Is, is that likely to be for the reserve week of the 19th of March? Because I've, I've, I have a problem if it's earlier, and I, I really feel I would wish to contribute to that. Um, discussion, but that, that week would be fine. But if it's before then, I'll have a problem. Uh, yeah, well, it will only be in one of the days that I where I put reserve on the um, on on the timetable. Um, I think, in all likelihood, it will have to be one of the days now, won't it? That's during that week where I have set out four reserve days. I think it'll have to be that week. So, so yes, we'll, we'll obviously have to have a look at it and, and see officer availability and yeah. such like matters. But it won't be in the intervening period because of availability. Um, okay. Um, in which case, then, um, I make it 17.48. I adjourn the hearing to resume in this room tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you.